All right. So one of the most important things that we take away from the previous activity is that there really is not much difference algebraically between permutations and braids as far as the generators and relations, the presentation out of which we can build those respective groups. Namely, <clears throat> both permutations and braids satisfy the disjoint pairs relation, right? If I have in a braidogram or a braid, if I have adjacent twists that are far enough away from each other that they're not sharing a strand, that I can do whichever one of them before the other that I want to, and I get the same result. So the disjoint pairs relation is still satisfied um, by uh, both braids and permutations alike. The skein relations, likewise, are also satisfied by both permutations and braids. Right? We can check that just by building the braids that are created, like sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma, sigma 1 versus sigma 2, sigma 1, sigma 2. Right? We can directly show, just using my diagram rules, uh, that those two braids are in fact the same. And so what seems like a small difference, but turns out to make all the difference in the world, is that permutations have the property that if I do an adjacent transposition, if I trade place one with place two, for example, and I do it again, it undoes itself. Whereas in a braid, because my twists now have an orientation, if I do a twist with a positive orientation, and then I twist that again with a positive orientation again, I don't get back to the identity. Right? I don't have a, uh, a trivial braid at that point. Um, and so my permutation groups satisfy all three of these types of relations, order, disjoint pairs, and the skein relations. Braid groups are characterized by satisfying just relation two and relation three. The order of elements that are the generators of the braid groups is infinite. I can keep twisting my adjacent pair in a positive orientation as many times as I want to, and it will never untwist itself back to the identity. That's the only difference algebraically, is that, that order relation that we had for permutations is now gone for braids. But the other relations, the disjoint pair relation and the skein relations, are still true, and they still characterize how the generators in the braid group interact with one another. So in your groups, what I'm going to ask you to do um, is to start thinking about what happens if I try to capture the behavior that permutations and braids have in their, in their various groups, right? the generators and relations and the words and all that. Can we capture that behavior using matrices? Matrices, it turns out, can give us a lot of rich algebra. Um, because matrices are one of the only objects that we come across when we learn algebra up through the grades um, that aren't commutative, right? If I multiply two matrices together, in general, A times B as matrices is not the same result as B times A. And so matrices, for that reason, can capture a lot of non-commutative kind of behavior, which we're going to need to be able to do to represent permutations and braids because, because of the skein relations, right? Um, the generators in those groups don't always commute one with another if they share an adjacent strand. So matrices seem like a good candidate to capture some of that non-commutativity behavior. And so what you're going to do in this activity um, is first investigate these two matrices, the matrix that has the entries 0, 1, 1, 0, and the matrix that has the entries 1 minus t, t, 1, 0. And this t here is just a variable. Okay, so some of the matrix algebra that we're going to do today uh, is going to have variable expressions in the entries of the matrices. As you might expect, the kinds of algebra we can describe with matrices that have variable expressions in them is more rich and varied than the kinds of algebra we can describe with just the numbers, 0, 1, 1, and 0. Um, but the first thing you're going to do is just kind of investigate what those 2 by 2 matrices do when they multiply vectors. Right? If I multiply vector xy by the matrix 0, 1, 1, 0, what it does is it turns xy into yx. Right? Um, so think about why that might help us to, uh, to do the project that we're trying to do here. Uh, and then also x of t, the version that has the, the expressions of t inside of it. And what you'll be checking, in part, uh, is that these matrices, or matrices that can be built out of these kinds of building blocks, um, these matrices can satisfy the kinds of relations that the elements in our permutation groups and our braid groups can satisfy. So what we're trying to do is create a collection of matrices that walk and talk and quack just like the elements of our groups that we're interested in do. And if that relationship is close enough, then we should be able to answer questions that we have about braids by translating them into questions about matrices. And we have a lot of computational uh, firepower that we can bring to bear on matrices. We have the whole of linear algebra 
uh, that we can bring to bear on those questions. So we feel like we can do a lot if we can represent our scary group objects by matrices instead. And one of the tools that you'll be able to use, and I'm going to ask you to use today to do this, is SAGE. SAGE is the open source computer algebra system that if you were a math major uh, at Bridgewater, you probably had the occasion to use SAGE at least once, um, hopefully more than once. Uh, and so this SAGE is going to give you the uh, ability to do some matrix computations. So you can multiply these matrices together, B1, B2, B1, um, to, to, to determine whether the skein relation is satisfied, for example, by these matrices. We need to know whether B1, B2, B1 gives us the same matrix as B2 times B1 times B2, for example. And so to evaluate one of these SAGE code blocks, you can just click on Evaluate. And it shows you the result of that calculation. It does it right in the web page. Um, so if you want to evaluate a different product, just change this project product, sorry, and click the evaluate button again. Right. Um, and so what I'm asking you to do here is to investigate whether these matrices behave just like the generators of the braid group on three strands happen to behave. Right. Um, similarly, with finding inverses of these matrices, after all, if we're generating uh, a braid we need to have both the positive crossings available to us, but also the negative crossings available to us. And we expect that if we're representing the positive crossings by some matrix, that we should represent the negative crossings by the inverse of that matrix. So that if I were to multiply those two matrices together, the result would be an identity matrix, which is the representative of the identity braid, right? the braid that has no crossings uh, in it whatsoever. Right? So you'll find the inverse of those matrices. You'll compute a matrix product um, that represents a braid word. And then Sage will also give us the ability to plot braids. And the way that it's doing that um, in the notation here is we construct a braid just by listing, and this goes to one of the questions we had before the break today, it lists the, uh, the indices that would be a part of the word that bakes up that braid, it just lists them in order. So 2, 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1, would be how we tell Sage, I want to know something about this braid, sigma 2, sigma 1, sigma 2, and then a negative sigma 1, negative sigma 2, and a negative sigma 1. Uh, and when I execute this Sage code, the result is that it actually gives me a colorful rainbow plot of that braid for your diagramming pleasure. Um, and so the big theme of this activity is the relationship between the braids and their algebra and their diagrams on the one hand, and the properties of the matrices that we're using today to represent those braids on the other hand. And the culminating exercise of this activity, this will probably spill into the week between now and our next class, is that I'm going to ask you to start making the connection between braids and knots. And the way you'll do that is by looking up a knot in the knot info database. So this is a wonderful uh, database created by the, a couple of math folks at the University of Indiana. Excuse me. What the knot info database lets you do uh, is to just sort of list out um, a number of different types of knots by crossing number. Crossing number is how many crossings are there in the most simplified diagram of my knot. Um, so let's say I want to see crossings up to, you know, up to eight. And we can also have the not info database tell me braid notation for that knot. If I do that and I submit this knot search, what it does is it lists out a bunch of knots by name. So knots have names, interestingly enough, the prime knots have names, classified by the number of crossings in their simplest diagram. That's the part that comes first. So uh, this one has three crossings. Um, and then after that, an index of sort of which one of the five crossing knots are we talking about? There's two, it turns out, two distinct five crossing knots. Um, that are in their simplest form. The first one has this braid notation, the second one has that braid notation. And this braid notation that the knot info database gives us, we can actually put directly into Sage as the braid notation for the associated knot. So for example, if I want to know something about the knot 52, it has this braid notation 1112 negative 1 2. What I could do is I could just write that braid code directly into my Sage 111 2, negative 1, 2. I think that's what it was. Let me just double check <laughs> that I got that right. 1, 1, 1, 2, negative 1, 2. Evaluate that out. And Sage generates for me a diagram of that braid. And so the, the relationship between the braid and the knot is that we would just connect the, end of the, the ends of the strands at the top to the ends of the strands at the bottom. So this blue end point here would connect with this green end point down here. This green end point here would connect to this red one down here, and this red one would connect with this blue one down there. So we connect the top three 
positions with the bottom three positions, so it closes itself together and it forms a knot for us. So that's that's the knot that then the knot database is referring to as five underscore two is the name of that knot. Um, I also put a link in this activity to uh, Dale Rolfson's knot table. Um, this is a table of knots that comes out of the Bible of knot theory called Knots and Links by Dale Rolfson. Um, but it's an online version of the index that Rolfson has in the back of that book that shows diagrams for all these knots. And so the diagram for 5-2 uh, is this diagram right here. So if you want to make this knot at home, or if you want to see a diagram for the actual knot that's represented by this braid that we're talking about here, um, then this would be the diagram for it. And so at the end of this activity, uh, number nine, it's going to ask you to pick one of those knots from the knot atlas and its braid notation, and you'll do some uh, you'll do some investigation to see how that knot relates to the braid diagram, which also relates to a matrix which we can use to represent that braid, okay? and we hope also therefore represent that knot in some way. So the first phase of this activity had you just taking these two by two magical building blocks and figuring out that at least these little two by two matrices have some of the properties that we would want transpositions from braidograms, anagrams, and twists, positive orientation crossings from braids to have, right? This two by two block matrix 0, 1, 1, 0 has the property that it transposes two coordinates in a vector, which sounds like something that we'd want to do to represent an interchange of two adjacent positions in an anagram, right? Um, and also it has the property because of that, that if I square that matrix, so I multiply it by itself, I get the identity matrix. And therefore the relation, the order relation for the generators of a permutation group that says that every generator, if I multiply it by itself, I get the identity element. That's also satisfied by that two by two matrix X, right? And so it seems like that's a good candidate to represent something that looks like a generator for a permutation group, right? Um, similarly, if we soup things up and consider these three by three matrices, where these three by three matrices were created by taking that two by two block that I had, my X of T, two by two block, and placing it in the first and second columns or the second and third columns, respectively, of a three by three matrix, right? And filling in the rest of that matrix with the rows and columns of an identity matrix, right? This one, zero, zero here and one, zero, zero there. Those are the row and column, the first row and first column of an identity matrix. And so, put an identity matrix there and then put this two by two block in the other piece of it in the second and third columns, that that, we hope, might represent a positive orientation twist done to the second and third strands of a braid that has three strands in it. Similarly, this B1 matrix is the positive of the oriented twist on the first and second strands. And when I say is, that word is is doing a lot of work, right? Um, because on the one hand, we're twisting two strands of a braid. On the other hand, we're multiplying by this weird three by three matrix that has T's in it. But at the end of the day, when you compute, for example, the matrix product B1, B2, B1, you get this matrix. And if you switch it around to do B2, B1, B2, you do that evaluation, you get the same matrix product. So these two matrices, B1 and B2, satisfy that skein relation, right? Sigma i, sigma i plus one, sigma i. So when i is one, this is sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, is equal to sigma two, sigma one, sigma two. These matrices are walking, talking, quacking, just like the elements of the braid group do, according to the skein relation, right? Um, and so our hope is that these matrices can actually represent uh, the braid group generators good enough um, to be able to do braids by doing linear algebra instead. Multiplying out matrices to represent the products uh, that, that create a braid. For example, sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, right? This product that we got by multiplying out just a minute ago, put it back on the screen. This three by three matrix here that we got by multiplying, I guess it was technically B1, B2, B1, even though those products are the same. I just wanna make sure that we're on the same page here. This three by three matrix, our claim is that that three by three matrix uniquely represents this braid, the braid that we get by spelling out the generator sigma one, sigma two, sigma one in order, right? And it can do that precisely because we get the same matrix when I do the other way around, B2, B1, B2, as I get for B1, B2, B1, and I also get the same braid if I do sigma two, sigma one, sigma two, as if I do the sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, right? So the fact that the matrices are behaving the same way that the braid group generators do give us some hope that we can learn about braids by studying the matrices 
instead. And so the back half of this activity um, is going to involve you just doing a little bit, pushing that a little bit further and taking it out into the land of knots. So starting with a knot, get the braid notation for that knot, and then figure out what three by three matrix can represent that braid, and therefore we hope also that knot, right? Um, and the question we didn't quite get to talking about today is how can we be sure that the matrices are capturing enough of the behavior of the braids that we can translate every question about braids into a question about matrices? Um, and so the, the video at the bottom of this page um, actually gives us a preview to the answer to that question, which is we can't completely trust it in all situations. It turns out that we can trust the matrices to always tell us the complete story about their braids when my braid has two strands, when my braid has three strands. But as soon as my braids have five or more strands, we know for sure that there are braids that we can make that are not trivial braids, but whose matrix that we get by multiplying these matrices together in the way that we're doing here. The matrix actually turns out to be identity matrix. And that's a bad thing, right? Um, because an identity matrix, we want to only always represent the trivial braid, right? They should be telling us the same story. But as soon as I have five or more strands in my braid, I can make a non-trivial braid whose matrix is just the identity matrix. It's hard to do. And so most of the time we can be reasonably sure that our five by five matrices that we would get or whatever in that case would be telling us the full story. But the fact that even a single counterexample exists of a non-trivial braid whose matrix is trivial should give us a little bit of a misgiving, right? That there's something about braids that the matrices aren't completely capturing. Um, so two strands and three strands, okay. Five strands or more, it's the wild, wild west. Um, and actually more than that, the question about what happens with four strands, are the four by four matrices a perfect reflection of what's happening with braids on four strands? That question is actually unsolved in mathematics as of today. Um, so if, you, if knots and braids and this kind of stuff interest you and you can figure out a, an answer to that question, either by figuring out a counterexample, right, a strand, a, a braid with four strands in it that's a non-trivial braid, but whose matrix is the four by four identity matrix. If you can find me an example like that, then you and I are gonna be famous. Um, we can bring that immediately to publication um, and lavish praise on us. Um, it would be probably harder to do, um, and yet still really important to show that it actually is a perfect correlation, that the matrices tell the full story of four strand braids. But as of today, mathematics doesn't know the answer uh, to that question. Two and three are okay. Five and more are not okay. Four. We still don't know. Okay. Um, so I'm going to leave that out there as the as the teaser at the end of this class um, today.